Good morning and welcome to KGNU and welcome to Colorado in, and Boulder, the campus of CU Boulder. This is KGNU Denver Boulder. I'm your moderator this morning for a panel at the Conference on World Affairs. Now, this was originally founded in 1948 as a forum on international affairs. It's an annual conference and it expanded rapidly in its early years to encompass the arts, media, science, diplomacy, technology, the environment, and spirituality, politics, business, medicine, human rights, and so on. And that is pretty inclusive, you will all agree. It was Roger Ebert, the legendary film critic, and you will have heard Sam Fuqua discussing his contribution and the importance of uh, Ebert to the CWA. He said, it's the conference on everything conceivable. I have a couple of panelists with us here, and we will be having one join us very shortly. The topic under debate, and we'll hope it's a Socratic debate where people can fairly represent their opinions back and forth in, in a conversational manner for this particular panel. <clears throat> so everything is conceivable. So we do not have to talk about the actualities. We can talk about the impossible, and we can talk about the ridiculous, which might be quite <laughs> appropriate, who knows. The topic under discussion is uh, the Rx for our political system, the remedy, the prescription, what can be done about our political system? Does anything need to be done? Maybe it's just perfect, who knows? Two of my panelists are here. Aruna Kala, Kali, I beg your pardon, Kalyanam. <laughs> That's right. right. Aruna Kalyanam, uh, Democratic Tax Council, House Ways and mean committee, Means Committee, Tax, Tax Council and Select Revenue Measures Committee, Subcommittee Staff Direct Minority. It, it's a, it's a mouthful. <laughs> it is really a mouthful, especially at 8.30. <laughs> Daniel Stid is Director of the Madison Initiative at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. The goal of the Madison Initiative is to support and improve the health of representative democracy in the United States. So I'd like the two of you, we'll be joined by Marilyn de Garcia shortly, I hope. Uh, why don't you begin, Aruna, because you have a K, which was before an S. Aruna, why don't you put some context on your background as is relevant in its own right and is relevant to the topic, please? Certainly, and thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Um, I will start with a little bit of a, a disclaimer over here. Um, I think given that I'm one of the few people at this conference with a dot gov email address um, just that my remarks are mine and my own and I don't speak on behalf of the Ways and Means Committee Democrats or the Democratic members thereof so uh, with that out of the way uh, very quickly I've, I serve as um, Democratic Tax Council and subcommittee staff director for the subcommittee on tax policy at the Committee on Ways and Means it is it is funny that you asked me to go first usually whenever we do panels all revenue measures must originate in the house so the House person usually always goes first, and I'm fairly familiar with that. I've been on the committee uh, for 15 years this February, serving under six different chairmen of both parties and through three different administrations, soon to be a fourth uh, come November. Uh, I'm proud and privileged to uh, have been witness to a very interesting evolution of our political system, and it continues to evolve. So thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Now, Daniel Stid. Thanks. I work at the Hewlett Foundation, which is a, basically the philanthropic uh, entity that Bill Hewlett of Hewlett and Packard, those of you who are using HP computers, uh, uh, at one point contributed to this, um, set up. And it, we make grants to support nonprofits, researchers, advocates working in a variety of areas, uh, including uh, the, we're the largest funder working to combat climate change. Um, we do a lot of work to alleviate uh, global poverty, uh, working on education reform, and one common denominator across all of these uh, philanthropic uh, initiatives is that it presumes we have a, a minimally rational and functioning political system. And uh, insofar as we don't, we have a problem. So a few years ago, we decided that we needed to explore whether we could do something as a, as a private foundation to uh, support how our own system is working. We quickly came to focus on the institution of Congress as a, a place that was really the heart of the system and maybe where the heart of the problems were. So uh, one, one wrinkle about our work, and I'll be speaking about this today, is as a private foundation, we can't support or oppose any political party or candidate. Right. So if you hear me uh, do so today, I'm speaking as a private citizen, not as an employee of the, of the Hewlett Foundation. But anyway, and I, the, one other thing I would say is, 
this work is has been something that uh, over the course of my career I've been concerned about in that I, I wrote a, 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 a political science dissertation, a book on Woodrow Wilson who was one of the great critics of the political system. People forget that he was a reformer and an academic before he became president and, and was a great admirer of the British parliamentary system and wanted to bring that to the United States. So I think even from the outset of my work, I've been thinking about this issue, how can the United States uh, government work better? Okay, I'm going to ask you both now, looking at the 2016 elections yes. going forward, and it seems rather chaotic. So is there anyone on earth who could say, well, the political system isn't broken? Daniel, I'm going to bounce around between you because there's just yep. two of you at the moment. Is the political system broken? Is it something we need to do something about now? And what could be done about it? In what way is it actually broken? Well, I think one of the uh, things that's emerged in this campaign, um, and, and I, I want to make sure that we don't idealize what does it mean for the political system to work? And, and it's clearly a raucous campaign season, uh, and sometimes we don't like politics and the messiness and the raucousness, especially for people who hold different views, uh, articulating them. Um, but I, I think one of the things you're seeing surface in this election season is the fact that there are a lot of people who have been left behind by uh, trends in the economy due to globalization, uh, trends in the economy due to uh, how the U.S. financial system has evolved. And I think it's fair to say that both of the parties have uh, struggled to respond to those perspectives over time. And I think the insurgencies that you see uh, uh, from Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are articulating the perspectives of people who feel like they don't have as much of a voice in the system today. And I think <clears throat> in a democracy uh, where people are meant to have a voice, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the, the question is, can this unrest be channeled in responsible ways that lead to solutions that alleviate the, the problems that gave rise to it? Thank you, Daniel. Irina. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, your initial question is whether whether we think or whether I think that the political system is broken. Um, I kind of, in some sense, I don't believe it's one or the other uh, that it's broken, and it, or if it is broken, or it needs to be broken to be fixed. I think things can be improved um, always and, and, and at all levels. I would say one of the things that I that I would identify as probably needing to be worked on and could be worked on in this election cycle is this the sense of uh, an ever-growing disconnect between the American public, the voting citizenry, and their government. You know, I say I say this, this is a government of the people. This isn't just, uh, you know, any sort of uh, a collection of individuals in Washington. These are people that we elect to put there. And I think that there's, beyond that disconnect of your representation, I think there's um, there's a sense that people do not feel or see what government is doing in their everyday lives and and the investments that are made at a federal level and often at the state and local levels that are really having a strong impact and improving the quality of life of a lot of uh, American people today. And having a recognition of that, <clears throat> I think, makes it makes involvement in government better, which I think is probably one of the, the most key parts of a prescription to fixing it. Now, what the government is doing in the disconnect and, and people not feeling part of the system, I mean, is this true democracy, a two-horse race? That's fundamentally what it comes down to between the Democrats and the Republicans. They might throw in a third party at some point, a third nominee. Is that really democracy? Is that what democracy was intended to be? Versus? Other systems in other countries. Yes. Where so it sounds like you're objecting to the two horse race dynamic. Is that you, you want to see four more four more horses? Is or, it representative yeah. democracy with just the Republicans and the Democrats? So I, here's what I would say is actually I think we're seeing more representative democracy in this campaign than we've seen in in the more recent prior campaigns. What you have now is in in both the Republican and the Democratic Party candidates running with very different conceptions of what government should do and how it should do it. And so I think there is ferment within those parties. And so if you think about uh, you know, running from, uh, from left to right, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, John Kasich, uh, it's hard to place Donald Trump on the spectrum, but let's say he's somewhere between John Kasich and Ted Cruz. You know, that encompasses a, a pretty broad array <clears throat> of political perspectives. So I think in some ways the ferment and what makes this election season seem very messy 
is actually it probably is articulating representing a broader array of views than than might have occurred, for example, in the last election. And, and just to add to that, I think that the idea of, of two horses really kind of drills it down to party labels. And, and I would agree strongly with what Daniel said. Think about all the horses as actually the issues that are being debated here. You're talking about things like our tax system, like our health care system, our foreign policy. And, and those, you get to pick your horse in each of those issue areas and who's going to ride the horse that you want. So I would look at these issues and say, okay, I think candidate A is really good on this issue, but I kind of like where candidate D is, is thinking on this one. So it's, and I actually think it's better to think about these things, taking a step back and, and not really using your two party labels. You can see meritorious um, opinions and positions in, in all the candidates. So what I'm really getting at is that when we're in the ballot box in November, you do not get to vote for your president, do you? You don't tick ultimately for, you're not at this stage picking people who will be the president because of the system and the electoral college, the super delegates, the whole machinations, the system itself is contrived against an individual choosing the person who best, best represents them. Do you disagree, Daniel? Yeah, I disagree with the premise that the, 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 I think we need institutions that can take this kind of uh, teeming uh, democratic input and organize it in ways that are serviceable. And so we need mediating institutions uh, like political parties, uh, uh, for example, to do that because ultimately you need to build a majority and it's hard to do that with a cacophony of, of voices. Um, I, can I just say, can I, I want to flag, I think we're falling into a trap as we talk about our political system here, which is the obsession with the presidency is the be-all and end-all of the political system because the, the representative body in, the, in, in our constitutional structure is really Congress. And so I, I, it's, it's, we're, we're caught up in the fever of the presidential race. Well, we'll get back to yeah, that because yeah. I think it's something yeah. uh, some candidates yeah. particularly yeah. play on. Yeah. I'd like to introduce you all to Marilinda Garcinas. Sorry that uh, some probably... Some errors were made and well, you were taken to the wrong place. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We welcome you to the panel Thank to discuss you. the remedy prescription for the political system. Now, Marilyn de Garcia is an American former politician from the state of New Hampshire. A Republican, she served in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, representing the Rockingham 8th District from 2012 to 2014. I asked both Aruna and Daniel to sort of outline basically their ID, how mm -hmm. you want to be known to the world, and how it impacts this discussion today. Sure. And uh, my rampant apologies, I actually went to the radio station, <laughs> which was not where I was supposed to be. But in any case, happy to be here. I, I am a former, uh, I guess, retired politician, maybe now in rehabilitation. <laughs> no. But in fact, I served uh, from 2006 to 2014. I served four terms in the New Hampshire legislature. and. Um, then subsequently got involved in federal politics uh, running for Congress in the second district of New Hampshire. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because when I first ran, I was 23 years old and uh, one could say quite naively uh, stumbling into what is an enormous apparatus, you know, in this country. And uh, there are so many moving parts, so many, um, influencing factors, but for me at the time, and uh, New Hampshire is a great example of this, but I, I was just thinking of actively participating as a citizen in uh, what is our process, you know, what is our civic governance, and, you know, I think the first step to being an involved, um, responsible citizen is, of course, voting and um, being informed about the issues, coming to an understanding of what you might feel on certain issues, uh, what you think about them, and then you know making a decision accordingly. And then the next step, of course, is to get involved. So that could mean supporting a candidate, that could mean running yourself. Uh, for me, um, I actually, no one in my family had run for office or been really involved um, in that uh, way. And so I thought I would work on a campaign. And then it was at that time that someone suggested to me, why don't you run yourself? So I did. And that's what kind of kicked uh, everything off for me. So um, I would say that 
at its in its essence it's a beautiful thing you know that we all can be active participants in um, what is um, the governing of our our states and our country and what is humbling is that the decisions that are made uh, despite all of what seems to be a circus at times you know in the media and the uh, very ridiculous nature of things at the end of the day elected officials are making decisions that affect everyone's lives um, and if you look at states as a microcosm of the uh, federal Congress and uh, and the various branches really they are making decisions that then um, can set precedent for things that occur in other states and then affect what occurs on the federal level and with our role in the world being a global superpower in fact those decisions change the course and trajectory of the entire world thank you marilinda i'd like to get back what you missed is i'm trying to understand whether mm -hmm. we all believe this is meant to be an idealist conversation mm -hmm. where we could discuss the possibilities for the very best political system mm -hmm. I asked Daniel if the system now is fundamentally mm -hmm. a two-horse race he said we are not voting yeah. for the president we're voting for Congress mm -hmm. so I didn't say that I, sorry. Said, I said that we we tend to focus okay. too, much too much on, much on the, the president now look, can we just broaden it out to international mm -hmm. systems I mean India comes to mind mm -hmm. Germany comes to mind mm -hmm. It is much closer to the one man, one vote ideal. Mm -hmm. In many countries still, mm -hmm. you put a tick on a name. In India, you go in and you make a mark with your finger sometimes mm -hmm. because of illiteracy. Right. How far away are we from the ideal? You, Marilyn, talked about the machinations and the systems. Mm -hmm. Aruna, I'd like you to pick up because Daniel had his moment and then I'll come to Marilyn. How far away are we from the ideal? Is this what represent what we see in terms of the system, the system specifically? Then we'll get to the personalities. The system, how far away is it with the electoral college, with the money, with Citizens United? Just how far away do you think it is from representative democracy compared to other countries? Sure, that's um, that's a pretty uh, loaded question. I'm going to try to unpack it in in pieces. Um, so first, when you say how far are we is from an individual vote counting for the individual that they're voting for. Uh, I'm, I come here from Washington, D.C., and it is a very loaded, very competitive media market, and you are seeing a lot of competition in the primaries right now. So, you know, when you, when you were talked about the two horses, and I proposed maybe you have 10 or 20 horses, given the issues that you're looking at, I can look at those issues and look at all of those candidates and say, okay, who would I want to vote for for this representative. I, I will tell you, I do live in the District of Columbia, so it's really not as much, but I do have family in Maryland who are looking very closely at candidates for both the House and Senate, um, uh, open seats in, in those areas. So you, you're, you're really going back to seeing what these individual candidates represent and how that represents you. Now, if you want to put them under the buckets of Republican and Democrat, you can, but I do think that there are a number of Republicans that reflected a lot of ideas that are important to people, and there are a lot of Democrats that do, and you might just sort of pick the one that fits you best. I mean, to say that each person will actually should have their one ideal candidate to vote for, I think is it's, um, it's unrealistic to begin with. So to clarify, are you saying that, in fact, people need to pick a candidate and ignore the party system? Or is you saying, are you saying they should, or that's what they do, or in fact, the candidate selection process overrides the system as we see it formally. I think uh, I, I would probably say that you know you have we do have two parties in this country and the two parties have platforms. Okay, even just imagine it's sort of like a menu. You can ask the chef to make you some things off the menu, but you know if you're going to one type of restaurant or another type of restaurant. Generally, I would probably go to a restaurant where I like the food as opposed to something where I don't like the food. But would you so actually, you sorry say, to interrupt, but would you still mm -hmm. say that about the Republican campaign as we see it now? Because I, I am not no. seeing that. I'm I don't think, I don't divisions. think, I don't think I'm alone in saying this is a Republican primary and election unlike anything we've ever seen before. Um, and this is why I again call into question the, the relevance or importance of, of party title. Because you really are. This is, and the first time, and I think in quite a quite a long time, I think this holds on the Democratic side as well. Yeah. You have someone 
who has, has historically never identified as a Democrat, running in the Democratic primary. Um, you're really getting to the people and beyond the party party names. It just so happens we're, you know, you guys are holding one umbrella, we're holding another umbrella, and that's where the people are. Before I move on to Marilinda, I, I want to understand in the context of the world. This is a world affairs conference, which is why I'm banging on about it. What is the position of American democracy relative to other systems? Aruna, just finish the point and then ask Marilyn and come back to Daniel. I'm sorry. What, what is, is the, the position? What is the status of American democracy relative to other countries where they do not have this system, with the Electoral College, with Citizens United, with money funding people from school board on and up? What sure. is the health, the state of the system of democracy in the United States compared to other countries? So I would say there's a lot of unique and, and different aspects um, with respect to the nature of our country that will obviously di uh, distinguish it from other countries. First of all, the size. Second of all, the demographic uh, makeup. Third, the regional, um, re regional concerns and things that are important to people in different regions and the variations therein. So to compare it to some place like India, where I mean, I think you could fit most of India in the continental the United States, and the population is between three and four times as large. You know, it's it's sort of an apples to bicycles comparison in some ways. Yet you and have yet two you of the oldest a, democracies. You can run as a communist. You can run as anything you like. You can run as the pink flying monkey brigade if you want. You not, can run I don't as think, anything. I don't think anybody is stopping you from running for, as any of those every year. No, but there is true choice. You you can take a position. You can call yourself a party and you can run and have some chance of getting electoral support. Is that possible here? Does it matter that it's not possible here? Maybe you think it doesn't matter. I mean, I believe one of the presidential candidates was elected as, as a democratic socialist, as in, you know, to statewide office twice in Vermont, you know, both in the House of Representatives. So to say that there's, there were only limited to two parties, I think is a, is a bit of a, um, a misnomer. And to go, you can even look at local city councils and local governments where you have people of all stripes being elected and representing their people. Um, and I, I kind of want to go back to Daniel's point that our election, our, our political system isn't just the presidential race. You go back and you see where the change is being affected. Mari Linda said something that I thought was, was critical to figuring out where our, our system is going. It's the notion that our state governments, our state legislatures, and our local legislatures have really become these incredible incubators for ideas. Because I think in a lot of ways, those governments can move, they can move much more quickly mm -hmm. than, than our federal uh, government. So you can take ideas and move them around. And I think that those, the variety of parties that you're describing that, that might come up in a German election or, or somewhere else are, are very well represented at those levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Runa. We do have a question from a listener. Um, Marilinda, I'd like you to work this into your answer. Sure. <laughs> a listener has contacted to say, how does this discussion tie into the current caucus system? where here in Colorado, the majority of Democrats caucused for Sanders, but the superdelegates are pl pledging for Clinton so they could overturn the will of the people. Marilinda. <laughs> sure. Now, I come from a state, uh, full disclosure, that has a primary system. So, <laughs> so we're bewildered about caucus <laughs> systems and, and what that actually means. But no, to get back to the other point, look, um, first of all, I know we talk a lot about a democracy. It is important, though, it is important distinction that we are a constitutional republic, and that means something. Um, but beyond that, I think, um, you know, someone said that we may not have a perfect system, but it's the best there is, and I think there is some truth to that. Um, so at in the structure, I think things have the potential to work well. The way our government is designed and structured, I, I think it's a good system. However, I will say that I think the way things are today is somewhat of a reflection of our society when it comes to campaigns and what the uh, politicians do and how things are run. And that um, this relates to both the money side and the media side. This is entertainment driven, right? These are very serious issues that, as I was saying, elected officials made. Certainly the presidency, you know, in, is of foremost importance in many respects in terms of being a leader and setting the tone of, um, 
how everything should be going. Um, and yet, do we really hear a lot of debate when you look at the headlines on substantive issues? No, it's the gotcha questions. It's the, oh, you know, look, look how funny this one said this one, uh, this, th this other person said this. It, it becomes a race to get clicks. It becomes a race to have people tune in and, you know, so they can laugh about it on talk radio and whatnot. It's, it's really sad that that's what it becomes. And then, um, frankly, it's very, it's a very long process where every candidate is just vying to get free name, uh, free press, basically. They talk about Donald Trump. Well, he, I, I think the number was he got a, about $1.6 billion of free, basically, advertisement. Um, and that's because ratings drive what the journalists and media focus on. And now, you know, that's sad. I think it's really sad. Um, and you think, well, how can we actually fix that? I mean, the topic of this is what is the prescription to fix this? Well, you mentioned India. I think they have a five-week um, election or campaign process, right? The so that ours is, is like two years long, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and then you talk about um, Britain, right? They don't. Uh, they only do. Uh, is it public financing when it comes to TV? Very They're limited. not allowed to yeah. run. Uh, you know, commercials and attack ads and all that kind of thing. So is there a way, if we believe that our process is of value and, you know, is good um, foundationally, maybe it's just little tweaks like that. You know, maybe there's something we could do that can cut down on what it's become today, which I think is just entertainment driven. We have a short attention span, we do. Um, we don't necessarily want to, in many cases, do our homework, you know, go read the 50 page policy paper. I mean, that's not gonna get attention, everyone tunes out. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think it's symptomatic of the, our entertainment-driven culture. Thank you very much, Marilyn. I think it was Churchill, wasn't it? It may not be a good system, but it's the best system money can buy. <clears throat> and, in, and I think that is very relevant now. Greg Pallast has written a book about the best democracy, democracy money mm -hmm. can buy. I'd like to narrow down about the money. I mean, we all seem to ignore it. You just said, Marilyn, about people being able to win mm -hmm. uh, airtime, which mm -hmm. is a nifty little tweak on the system, but it's mm -hmm. fundamentally a money-driven system. Well, Does that ma it. Sorry, Daniel, your turn. Is it, is it a problem? Well, a couple things. One is the, uh, it's, 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 uh, it allows a lot of different perspectives to come to the fore. So one thing about our campaign finance system is that it enables someone like Bernie Sanders or from a very different angle, Donald Trump, to basically emerge and articulate perspectives that hadn't been articulated by uh, other candidates and, and, and the parties in which they are affiliated with. So the, the, this is a big freewheeling system. Uh, we have a First Amendment that guarantees the right to express a wider range of views. That uh, uh, sets the stage for a campaign finance system that's different. Uh, than you see in parliamentary systems. We, the fact that we have fixed electoral terms, that every two years we have a House race, every six years uh, on Stager terms we have a Senate race, uh, gives us a longer campaign season. You know, I think one thing about American politics is that the, the, the politicking and the governing are intertwined. Uh, and as we see in Silicon Valley, that's not a bug, but a feature of the system, that the, the founders envisioned a system where uh, there would be, you know, fights about what the government should do and how it should do it in, in, the, in the capital, but that the, they would be taking core, uh, place in the court of public opinion, uh, which is political, and that people would be responding to those fights, uh, rallying to one side or the other. So, uh, I'm coming back to you on this. I just need to remind people that you're listening to a live broadcast here from the what, Conference on World Affairs at KGNU Boulder, Denver. On the panel here, we have Marilyn de Garcia, Aruna Kalyanam and Daniel Stid. So carry on with that point, please. Sure. And the the um, the other thing I would say, and this is this is where we might uh, uh, spike up some controversy. I think one of the things that has changed about our uh, system of campaign finance is that uh, through a lot of very well-intentioned reforms and some Supreme Court decisions, we've ended up in a situation where the parties or at a disadvantage relative to outside groups. And I think that is something that undermines democratic accountability, right? You, How so, the parties? Uh, so, so in particular, the McCain-Feingold uh, Reform Act um, 
uh, uh, early in the last decade um, did a couple of things. It put uh, contribution limits on parties. It um, also established uh, limits on the extent to which national and state and local parties could coordinate their activities. Um, and uh, that combined with, a, with Supreme Court decisions has led to a situation where huge swaths of money are coming We're into We're talking Citizens United, yes, specifically. Yes, in Super SPAC. And yeah. in, a, in a, a string of cases, not simply Citizens United, that now have much more money coming in from outside of the system, outside of the accountable parties. You can vote. Uh, if you don't like what the Democrats or Republicans are doing, you can vote against that. Uh, and actually, yeah. Daniel, allegedly some of it foreign money. Ellie Weintraub wrote a piece in, in the New York Times, I believe, about that we would not know how much foreign money is coming under the present system. Is that something you want to pick up on, Arena? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think that there is, uh, I think there's a lot of things that have been dramatically changed uh, following the Citizens United ruling in our political system. Um, I don't want to sound too cynical, but I think money in a lot of ways does equate influence. And I'm not saying that necessarily over actual politicians, but if you think about it, if you have a, a, a passive, you know, uh, an influential system that is passive, meaning you have investment in advertisements, and if you have a, a citizen, uh, a voting citizenry or a public that isn't willing to go in and, and read the 50 page policy paper or research the issue that's important, you just turn on the news and you sort of, or you watch these commercials or they happen to come on in between your favorite TV show and, and you're thinking, oh, that, that sounds pretty good or, or maybe that issue, it's funny, what, 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 I go, okay, we should go, maybe go that way. And a lot, of, a lot of that influence that comes at voters passively is being funded by, by private corporations, some by bundled money and some coming from foreigners, although that is, we, we know that foreign um, contributions in our systems, that is, that is legal. That's not to say it isn't happening, but it is, it is not something that is allowed under our laws. But if you open that up a little bit more, I think that the way to combat that and to ensure that you have a more informed voting citizenry and even you're more informed about who is giving you your passive information is to uh, encourage the strongest amount of disclosure possible. And that is some, I think that a number of people and, and, and communities all over the country would love to see Citizens United overturned. Uh, Aruna, um, can I just bring yeah. in a, another listener question? It's not specifically to do with money, but it relates to the money also. Another listener is asking, what about the debates? And of course, there is a money piece in the debates, but they're controlled, the listener says, by the two parties, and they limit access to third parties for the most part. And Green Party candidates have been arrested trying to participate in debates, Nader and Stein, for example. So what about the debates? What about the financial access or, you know, the whims of certain mega media entities who decide whether or not someone will or will not debate a little spat going on between a host and a candidate, for example. So that, again, is a money thing. So, so what about the listener's question? What about the debates? What yeah. part do they, is it true debate? What about the money in the debate? I think Mary Linda touched on it um, in, our, in our kind of opening remarks when so much of this primary season is, is about entertainment, is about ratings, it's about page views, it's about clicks. So we're in this sort of jungle part of, this, of our process that is very much driven by that. And, and I don't think you have to go any further than looking at what these individual broadcasters' ratings have been and how they look for ratings, how they say, oh my goodness, this debate had the most viewers compared to this one. It wasn't really about a discussion on the policy or it was more so about what was the, the not maybe not the gotcha question, but the gotcha statement that was made. And that's, everyone refers to that one statement, not about the exchange of policy ideas. And that's what they're known for. Uh, it's, it is sincerely my hope and, and actually my true belief that this conversation gets elevated once you've, you've narrowed down your field to who we think are going to be our candidates. Come to can, I, can I take issue? I, I oh, think close. the notion that the, 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 the elimination of, of, of minor or third parties from the debates is about money is, is just wrong. No, it's not it's, about it's, money, but money it, is part the, of the, the reason you the, get the, access. The, the, not really. The primary reason is that we have a national elective office in the presidency. And to get elected to the presidency, uh, you need a majority. And so what I would say to um, uh, our, my green friends out there is that if you really want to have green policies characterize uh, national policy, work with one or both of the parties and work within them to make that happen. Because so you need, sort of Trojan horse. Uh, yes, you need to work with and through the parties 
to have your influence registered. In a, in a classic example of this, and I would distinguish between, say, Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, both protest movements that arose in the context of the Great Recession. Um, and uh, the, 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 with one big difference in what happened afterwards is the Tea Party uh, started showing up to party meetings in the Republican Party and have now had a tremendous influence within the Republican but Party. But the Tea Party also raised a phenomenal amount of but, money. But the, the real influence of the Tea Party is the fact that at local, the, 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 the national stuff is a little bit of red herring. It's that the local party committees where they were showing up and just taking over central committee after central committee. Taking over. Yes. You, you use those words advisedly? Yes, because they, or? yes. I mean, that, that, <laughs> the, you know, the, the issue, you know, that's, that's what's happened is they have decided to organize and work their way up through uh, huge swaths of the Republican Party. And if, and if other uh, protest groups or advocacy groups want to put a similar stamp on policy, they need to do the same well, thing. Well, I mean, we, it is allegedly possible that other parties are doing this. I mean, we need a reminder that not just not quite 16 years ago, you did have a Green Party presidential candidate. Yeah. I think you're speaking a little bit to the strength of the Green Party right now if they haven't been able to elevate a candidate to that level this time. And I, I would go one step further. It, I think you could make a very plausible argument that the Green Party candidate in 2000 did profound damage to the Green Party cause because it contributed to the defeat of Al Gore, who would have been the strongest uh, 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 environmental president we've had. So again, if you, in our system where you have a national presidential office, you need to assemble a national majority, you want to consolidate and work with one party or the so other. So are you actually saying that people like Ralph Nader should somehow work with the Democrats or with the Republicans or get, it's a two horse race. We're talking consensus politics. Why I keep talking about two horse race is all based on consensus. But we don't, we don't ever think that, I mean, don't ever, in every aspect of our lives, I always try to live by this notion of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good or the best, you know, the best you can have. So if you're going to live your life by pursuing perfect and never quite getting that, I don't think it's, it's effective overall. I would like to pick up Marilind on this because you sounded very idealistic. You were very young when you went into politics. You're still very young now. <laughs> but you were very young. You went in for idealistic reasons. Mm -hmm. Arun has just suggested everybody should settle. I mean, in European politics, I must tell you, in Japanese politics, a lot of countries, people vote, vote for the person they think will do the least harm, rather mm -hmm. like a doctor and a Hippocratic Oath sure. who swears to do no harm, people vote for the person who is least noxious. Right. Um, your idealism, and, and what Arun is saying, does that sort of trouble you slightly, that you need to sort of settle? Um, no, I think it's actually quite realistic. Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of people can find a lot of fervor, you know, for a particular candidate and think, oh, this is, you know, the be all and end all of everything I've ever wanted policy wise and whatnot. But then they'll always be disappointed um, because there are influences once someone's in office and just in the machinations of the legislative process, you know, you, you go in with the idea for one type of bill and it comes out slightly different and people will say, you lied, you know, you betrayed us, et cetera. So uh, my only point in saying that is that really, realistically, the only person or candidate or, you know, elected official anybody could possibly agree with 100% of the time is themselves. Right. And so in that case, you'd better run for office <laughs> if you want, you know, someone to perfectly reflect uh, what you want to see in office. But beyond that, in terms of idealism, I think, again, it's a wonderful thing that People can, uh, as they say, try to be part of the change they want to see. They can be active, as you mentioned, the Tea Party. Well, good for them. You know, they organized, got involved, and uh, made changes, you know. Um, and sure, so on the other side, maybe they should do that as well if that's, you know, what they want to see occur. But the sad part is that, going back to money, that at every step of the game, that's a big challenge and a, a very daunting pros uh, prospect um, for people that are considering getting involved. So on the one hand, campaigns, right? Obama ran the first billion dollar campaign and it's certainly, I think, only going up from there. Um, and anyone uh, in my little state of New Hampshire, we have two congressional districts, so I was running in one of them, and I had to raise one and a half million dollars, which was not even enough. Um, I was running against an incumbent uh, from the other party, but you know, it wasn't enough. I was Gosh. badly outspent. Um, but why did I have to do that? Because you need media, and I'm in the Boston media market, and it's expensive, and 
all along, even though I was the most experienced legislator of the bunch, including my incumbent congresswoman, the mark of viability that I was held up to for the first number of months I was running was how much money had I been able to raise. But it sounds, Marilinda, it, maybe it's too personal a question, you don't want to discuss your situation, but you were very idealistic sure. and you ran to improve the world, almost sure. certainly to improve America. And then you ran up against the money and you're no longer in the system. So well, did you become disillusioned? Um, I don't think it's so much about being disillusioned. It's just practically it's I don't think it's something sustainable and for me anyway I think professionally and personally if you really want to keep running for office you know for the rest of your life until you win you know I, I think it's it's extremely draining it's very difficult and there's there's just a lot of things one needs to consider both professionally and personally for me I wasn't gonna run again for my state house seat so I thought you know and was encouraged and you know decided this was a good opportunity to try to run you know for Congress and, and I didn't win I won my party's nomination but I, I didn't win the general so I've moved on to other things but the thing is government is everywhere and is in everything so here I am today I'm involved you know I'm involved still I don't have to be running for office to be trying to, you know, help and uh, help shape things and help educate people or whatever it is, um, you know, I choose to do. So I do think, as I said, there are problems with our process. Money is one of them. The other thing is, had I been elected with that same idealism, right? Well, guess what? As a member of Congress, to actually accrue power and influence, you actually have to raise money. That's how you gain, you know, seats of importance on important uh, influential committees and chairs and all of these. So, you know, again, it's a problem, and that all goes back to the campaigns because you have to be able to contribute as a fundraiser to your party well, so that you, you can Marilyn. be reelected and others can. But I, I mean, I think again, I, I I started with the premise. I think you found it to be a loaded question, but I mean, the truth is that money is an integral. Uh, almost impossible to divorce from the system. But George Washington, I, this is a listener question or audience question, I'm not sure which, originally said we should not become a bilateral system. America should not become a bilateral system. Does having only two parties, Daniel, then Aruna, then Marilinda, discourage political involvement? It seems from what Marilinda is just saying it does. Could a preferential voting system, something like perhaps proportional representation, which Germany has, for example, similar to Australia also, allow for a larger range of ideals and representatives? And representation, it must be said. Are you putting that to... to Are you first? Okay, then so I, 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 I um, uh, would concur with that, that the, uh, the potential to have, for example, multi-member districts uh, which is one of the, you know, the kind of the backbones of many of the European systems, uh, would be a very good thing. And in fact, our colleague from New Hampshire, I believe the New Hampshire State Legislature has multiple multi-member districts. Mm -hmm. And uh, people forget that really up until the 1960s, many seats in Congress were, were, were from the same districts. You had multi-member districts in Congress, which allows for a number of things. It allows typically for uh, greater representation of, of women. Um, so one of the things that the, the state of New Hampshire has is a much higher degree of women elected to statewide and federal office, and I think that's probably part of the reason why. Um, I think it also allows for uh, a better representation of those gradations within the, uh, within the parties, that, that if you just have a first-past-the-post system in a single-member district that you don't typically get. And states are largely free to, to experiment with that, and so many states have that. Many cities have that. Um, where I think there was an unfortunate federal law passed in the 1960s that ruled out uh, multi-member districts for Congress, but that could be something potentially that we revisit. Aruna, the Washington question, who said that we should not have a bilateral system. So, and, and I think that the, the, the tail part of that question is, following on the quote of Washington, the, could you repeat that part of the actual? Um, does having only two parties discourage political involvement? So I, what I would do is I kind of want to take a step back, and we're, we're putting this all back on the parties mm -hmm. and on who the president is. I, I would like to go back to something you said. I don't, I don't think I ever said that the voting electorate, I'm telling people to settle for their candidate. No, and, no. And I don't think that. No, I'm sorry if you but understood when you, that. I didn't But mean going that. further on that, you know, you talk about the sense of disillusionment. What we're doing is we're setting up this system where people don't feel good about participating. 
And if you're saying the only way for you to get in or, or if you're making the representation that the only way for you to be heard is to settle, that simply isn't the case and nobody feels good about this. I think there's a lot of thing, other things that are working to discourage people's involvement here that, that can be turned around easily, but if we approach involvement in our political system from this level of, oh my God, it's such a chore, or this is, it's never gonna work for me, so why bother? Uh, you know, I think that is going to be probably the worst, the, the most discouraging thing in, in increasing involvement. But, but can you I can just ask you, you, you seem to therefore think, though, that not settling, but consensus is actually the best way forward. Because this is consensus politics, where we have ideals and we each compromise to a sort of middle ground. So that's not I settling. I would say that's democratic politics. Yeah, yeah that's democratic. And those, and those are elements that are new to our society. I mean, every family unit lives by consensus and compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, your siblings, your friends, your roommates, that's how it So that's it's a works. workable ideal. It's sure. a workable ideal, and we see it working now. With Congress having been in gridlock for What, what last... I would say is I think we need to, to vote to elect people to ensure that that ideal is represented and that we don't sit in paralysis. But is I it no, working? No, I think I would, uh, like I just said, I think that there is, don't get me wrong, an election year is always a little bit different in the Congress. But if you go back over the previous, you know, five, eight, 10, 15 years, you can see the number of laws being passed, the amount of compromise happening. I think some of that and comes from- And what's about gridlock? which we have seen again and again yeah, and again. And I, I do think that is representative of what not being able to compromise. I do think in a lot of ways, in unfortunate ways, compromise has become a four letter word. And, and I think that it's important that we elect people on both sides who will try to dispel that notion. And this notion of, of settling, I just find really unnerving. But this idea that you can get good people together, there are so many good people up there. So really if we, it, hang on, if we agree things. that consensus is not settling, is there any way the consensus system can be improved given that it clearly has issues? I, I think, well, the kind of here, I, th I want to stand in defense of settling. I think that is the heart <laughs> of democratic politics. Because in a democracy, who rules? What's the principle by where one party or one, one, one leader or one group of officials will rule? The, the only way we have to determine that is that they have won a majority. That's the norm or the ethical principle that in a democracy says, okay, you guys get to decide. And how do you get a majority? You assemble a group of people who probably see the world differently. And they need to kind of tug and to and fro and settle and they can establish a legislative coalition that can support a particular policy or elect a particular candidate. And so to go back to the election of, of 2000, I think this proves the point. Uh, Ralph Nader and the few percent of people who f supported him refused to settle. They were so concerned about the principles that he stood for that they were going to cast their vote for him. What that effectively did is denied Al Gore the presidency, elected George W. Bush, and you have the Dick Cheney energy plan. And the hanging chest. Yes. So, so the, but, the, but, the, but the point is that in a democracy where you can't get everything you want, you need to figure out how do we assemble a majority. And so you have to put up with stuff that maybe in an ideal world, if it was just you deciding, you wouldn't have to put up with. I think that's democracy. I want to make three quick points on that. Consensus, Can I just say, luck. sorry, I need to identify this as KGNU Denver Boulder, the Con Conference on World Affairs. If you have any questions for the last minute of broadcast, please Twitter mm -hmm. them to at KGNU, at mm -hmm. KGNU. Sorry, Marilyn, no, to carry sure. on. So, you know, consensus is important because I think it's a mark of stability within a government. And so let's look, for example, at the example of Switzerland. Very stable seems to be working well. They have a lot of consensus why they don't actually even have a president and they have a rotational majority. So everyone is incentivized to work together well because nobody's going to be in power you know, for that long. It, the, the majority rotates. So that's a good thing, you know, I think, in that there isn't this sense of, okay, you know, we want everything, now we're gonna lurch to the right. Oh, now we want and we're gonna lurch mm -hmm. to the left. Whereas in our system, the other four letter word is this gridlock word. word. Well, you know what? Having these, um, you know, the House, the Senate, the executive branch, the um, judicial branch, et cetera, the divided um, separate powers. Well, everyone would say that one of the biggest concerns we have in this country is, right, our debt, our deficit, all this. This is what's talked about all the time. Well, the only time in recent memory, in recent decades, that um, we haven't actually increased that under both Republicans and Democrats was when we had gridlock, so to speak, because the presidency and the House 
were of different parties. So I would say that's a good thing. You know, and there's a stat out there that every American at any given point in time is in violation of at least a handful of federal laws because we have so many laws <laughs> on the books. So if things aren't being passed, in a manner of speaking, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Hopefully the gridlock allows for a situation where the only things that are getting passed or getting done are ones that the majority of people agree on. And then thirdly, I just want to say when it comes to this sort of demonization of the two-party system, yes, there are problems within that. I don't think it's perfect. But um, if we look at the Donald Trump example, he does not adhere to any Republican, conservative, whatever, you know, orthodoxy policy-wise or otherwise, but what he has done is very expertly manipulated what we have right now in terms of that entertainment-driven, uh, you know, clickbait culture of campaigns and media. And so he effectively is running as his own person, his own party. Sure, he's under the Republican label just because he had to, but he's actually not adhering to anything. So, you know, anyone can do that. I guess it's just a I'm matter of being I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you for that. Believe it or not, we're running up on the end of... Uh, broadcast time. I'm going to ask each of you, please, starting with Aruna, to sum up as much as you can, gathering what points you'd like to make going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that the, you know, I, I actually don't think our system is fundamentally broken at all. Um, I think that my, my co-panelists up here have said some wonderful things that I agree with very strongly. I do think everything always can be improved. There is no perfect. It's unattainable. But that said, the, the way that I think that our system could be improved is kind of number one, really trying to get the money out, out of our system. I, I think, Marlinda, I have, I have so much respect for you for running because I think the one bipartisan issue that everyone can agree on is how much elected, and can, elected officials and candidates hate raising money. It is, it is a chore, it is tedious, it takes up a lot of time, and it also takes up time that could be used to build consensus with your colleagues. Um, you know, there's a number of ways to do that. I think a lot of open disclosure. There is a, a bill in the House called the Disclose Act. I think just requiring people, if you're gonna give money or corporations give money, to, to show who, how much and to whom, so people know. Number two, I think um, if you can increase voter participation and information access. We don't wanna see what happened in the Arizona primary anywhere. People that believe in the free market should believe in increased voter participation. We are consumers in, in, in our political system just as much as we are, are consumers in our capitalist system. I think any efforts to, to curtail that are, are misguided, and I would say something along the lines of a federal motor voter law would be helpful. We should remove as many barriers as possible. If the states want to muck around and make it harder to vote in state elections, they can do what they want, but I think on a federal level, that's probably the most important. And then my third thing would be, we need to work to repair the relationship between the American government and the American people. That is people seeing the good that government does in their everyday lives and not approaching our system from this, this perspective of utter disdain and distrust. Um, I think that's it's very, it's unhealthy and it can take a toll on, on how things are gonna work. Aruna so those three. Nam, thank you very much indeed. Daniel Stid. Uh, Two or three quick things. One is, uh, is, is maybe you picked up from my remarks, I think we need a, a more measured and realistic conception of what democracy is and what it entails for citizens and politicians alike. I think it entails a certain amount of settling or a recognition that your views alone aren't going to win you a majority. You need to band together with others. And in that process of banding together with others, there's give and take. There's, there's some to and fro and you might have to sign on for something that you don't fully agree with but it is the best practical way of advancing your views. And that's a perspective that a lot of the commentary and critique of our political system tends to, tends to overlook. So that's one perspective of it. Another perspective is um, the extent to which we need to really restore the, the, the Congress as the, the first branch of our government. It's really in that institution where all the messiness and the, and the differences and perspectives in the country are meant to be represented and are represented. And there's a variety of things that have occurred both within the institution and in our perspective of it. Uh, it's a lot harder to, for citizens to make sense of Congress. The two different houses and 535 people arguing and politicking with each other, it's a lot easier to look at that Rose Garden ceremony or the Supreme Court steps and make sense of what's happening. But it's really in that branch where our representative democracy is occurring and I think we need to think more about that. Daniel Stead, thank you. Marilyn de Garcia, you have the same amount of time. Please sure. wrap. 
Um, yeah, I, I would agree that there's a big trust issue and that's uh, by and large a result of many of the things we've discussed today, you know, in that a lot of people go into it either as voters, as concerned citizens, as uh, people uh, running for office and they have, you know, an idea or conception of what it all should be about and, you know, what their concerns are and they want to see that their voices, uh, excuse me, that their concerns are heard, um, they want to feel listened to and they want results um, that in fact are uh, better all of our lives, work in the common good and uh, they want to see government as I think obviously there's a debate um, those who want government to do more and those that think government has gone far outside the bounds of what it can realistically do well. Um, and so, you know, that's a debate we need to have and we are. Um, but I think overall, it, the way it works now, yes, change, uh, we do need changes. Um, I think we're driven by what ends up being marginal um, arguments, everyone is sort of pushed to the extremes in either party when really if you talk to concerned Americans you find that there is so much agreement in the middle but somehow as things get distilled through our process all you hear from the ones uh, you know out there basically holding the mantle of either party and um, allegedly uh, you know speaking on behalf of Americans that it always seems to be on the margins of every issue. Again, uh, let's just look at immigration. I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm awfully sorry. We're coming to the end of our broadcast time. We will continue the debate in the live stream, I believe. I want to thank you for listening uh, and for your questions. We've got a number of tweets and a number of listener questions. Thank you for those. This has been a panel at the Conference of World Affairs, an annual event here at CU Boulder on the topic of prescription remedy Rx for our political system. Our guests have been Marilinda Garcia, Aruna Kalyanam, and Daniel Stid. And this has been KGNU Denver Boulder, and thank you very much for listening. So now we'll continue. I'd like to be a little more radical. I think what we're all saying here is that the system is fine. Not one of you actually has said it is broken and needs to be redesigned. But I would like each of you to tell me what is the one thing that might be considered radical that could be done to improve it to your liking, your personal liking, or the body politic that you think you may be involved with. What is it, Daniel? So what, thing, is, what is, I don't think, I, I think all of us would say there's plenty of room for improvement. So I, I think that's, a, I, I don't think we're all saying that things are fine. For my part, um, I, I do think the institution of Congress uh, has uh, on multiple ways shot itself in, a, in the foot. Uh, I think we are underinvesting in the institution. Um, uh, and just in terms of, uh, just, it, it, we spend about $2 billion annually to support Congress uh, and through the appropriations. And that might seem like a lot of money, but if you think about it, for each person in the audience, uh, each year the federal government appropriates about $3,000 for each man, woman, and child in the country. And that $2 billion translates into about $6 out of that 3,000. So we're effectively spending $6 to plan and design and oversee how the remaining $2,994 are spent. I think that's inadequate. I think we need to do a nest, when I'm not just blowing smoke at my panelists <laughs> and congressional staffer, but. We it, do it, work hard. One of the things, so there's, there's a temptation to think about reform of how do we keep money and influence out of politics. Should as, Citizens United be repealed in uh, your opinion? So I, I think a wide array of court decisions should be repealed, but I wanna finish my point. The, we, we tend to think that the way to deal with money in politics is to establish safeguards or stronger campaign finance. Money will always find a way. I think the lesson of the past 20 or 30 years is money is always going to be, come into the system. One way we, I think we can strengthen our system is to bolster the institution rather than having Congress be uh, you know, exposed to having to be dependent on lobbyists or K Street for information about policy making by making it easier for high quality people and public servants to work in Congress versus foregoing the income uh, that they have to forego by staying there, I think that will strengthen the institution. I also think another big thing that needs to change in Congress is that it needs to return to a majoritarian body, both in the House and Senate. Uh, traditionally, um, while the filibuster was in the Senate, it was very rarely used and 
policy decisions would eventually come up for a majority vote. Likewise, in the House, uh, the imposition of the Hastert rule, you know, by, by basically now a disgraced former speaker, uh, has led that body, which is meant to be quintessentially a majoritarian body, uh, to be one that requires a supermajority uh, to take action. I think that what that is doing is keeping preventing Congress from taking action, so more power is flowing to the presidency and the courts, which should not be in the business of making law. Thank you. Uh, Marilinda. Sorry, I mean, I'm switching it up a bit. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, ways, uh, things I could say here. It, it, in terms of radical uh, change, is that the original question? Can you sorry. speak into your mic? I'm yes. sorry. I mean, what is, if it, you're an idealist by your own admission, you <laughs> well, went into politics. To I'd say I'm a the, cynical what the optimist. One thing? Okay, <laughs> what is the one thing, if I asked you, standing on a cliff, what is the one thing that you would do that you believe would make a difference to the political system to fix it mm. if you think it's broken? Um, gosh, that's, I think, I mean, just going back to what I was talking about then, I, I think if the campaign season, uh, and this is, I haven't thought this out, so to speak, so I'm a little reticent to say this, but if it were just shorter in some way, you know, and again, does that mean curtailing uh, the, uh, uh, you know, private purchase of airtime and, you know, only allowing so many debates and only allowing this and cutting, you know. That's quite a lot of things. I don't, well, that's the issue, right? Yeah. I, I, details are important, yes. so that's why this question is a little bit difficult. But I would say it would be better if we didn't have a two-year election, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Arena? And I would I would add on, and here's, here's where, you know, I actually agree 100% with this whole idea of reducing our election period. Um, I can hear the cries on the other side already saying, please don't curtail my free speech. This is well, my exactly, electorate. Right? And mm -hmm. so you have to balance these things. Right. Going back to what you said on Citizens United, should it be overturned? Uh, my answer is yes, un until you get there. I think full disclosure and a lot of sunlight can kill a lot of the germs going on here. And when you, and something that Daniel said about, um, about the filibuster, you know, it's, it's not even just that the filibuster hasn't been used frequently. It's not, the filibuster itself isn't being used. Currently, yes. it is this threat of a filibuster. Yes. So you have paralysis without your elected official standing for 24 hours and really demonstrating their commitment. If you just say, well, we can't get, we've only got 59, we can't put it up. No, I think it's worth making, making that statement because at this point you're just, it's, um, it's almost, it's too easy to just say no and not do anything. We need to strain people's bladders in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've still got quite a lot of nice time. I wonder if there are any questions from the floor. Please, identify <laughs> yourself and then. Uh... Uh, my name's Alice Chandra Cox. Um, as Mr. Preston, due to the changes of population and demographic trends, it's likely that the population Identify yourself again, please. Alice Chandra Cox. Um, due to the population changes in recent years, is capping the House at 435 seats representative or Democratic? That's a terrific question. And what's really interesting is that at the time of the founding, uh, the, um, the size of the House seats, which were then in the tens of thousands, was seen as egregiously large. And one of the sharpest critiques of the Constitution uh, by the Anti-Federalists was that the, the House seats in the tens of thousands, you couldn't begin to represent that many people. Now we have uh, House seats in the hundreds of thousands, 750 is roughly the average. And so I think it's a very good question. Uh, and I would say that's something that should be revisited because the, 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 just the sheer scale of, of, of these seats, I think, do, do create problems for representation. Arena? You think the numbers are one issue, but the nature of the seats is another. You have this type of redistricting that is going on in every state every 10 years that draws districts that are, are very um, uh, homogenous. And I, I think that's a pretty big word to use here, but you know, we talked about this a long time ago. There used to be a time when people, when you would find people in your community that weren't like you. And that I thought was really, it's a really healthy thing. You don't find that as much. If you're drawing safe Republican, safe Democrat, you can have these seats that look like puzzle pieces and, and look like the, you know, the pterodactyl, literally. And, and at the end of it, you're just like, okay, are we protecting this? So it's not just the number, but I think having a, an elected, um, an, an electorate that, or, excuse me, elected officials that are responsible to all different types of people, not just one type of voter is gonna be probably critical as well. Marilinda? I would echo what they said. I thought they answered that very well. Um, I have a secondary question. Yes, please. Um, I'm actually currently a delegate, and this is the first time I'm participating like, in the political process, 
and it's been utter shenanigans. Um, <laughs> and I was wondering if there is a way to do away with the caucus system or the, like, at least in a certain extent, or even the delegate system. That well, funny, caucus. this is exactly what we've been trying yeah. to get away. And, and you've identified it in a nutshell. Thank you. Could you say just a bit more, give us a flavor for the shenanigans? And yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the main issues that I've seen recently is just that uh, there was in particular one man who attempted to like overthrow the chair in both instances of like the process. So I just think that the delegation and just like moving delegates from one process to another process next, like to the next, I think it's an elitist system and exclusionary because I mean, I'm a service worker, so I had to request every single day off in order to even participate. And I had to change shifts and it excludes mothers and it excludes people who have to work multiple jobs. And I think having delegates at all is really, it goes against the true values of what America stands for. Which one of you? I, I want to first just sort of congratulate you and applaud you on your participation because that is something, it is not for the faint of heart and it is so vitally important to have young people and young women in this system. And so first and foremost, it's really exciting to, to hear, hear that. Not as, as great to hear your experience, frankly. Um, and I think that when you have a more involved electorate, you, we force the change that, I'm sorry, you can't keep doing these between 10 a.m. and noon. I have, I have a job to be at, I don't have childcare, things like that, and this isn't an issue that just speaks to, to, to women or young people or, or service workers. It affects a wide swath of people, but, and at that point you do things like you start looking at, okay, maybe we need to change our delegate rules to say, hey, you know, this, this, this tier of power that has been there for so long, needs to start making accommodations, or need, and it's not even accommodations, because that seems like you're actually weakening your system. You need to actually have a process that reflects who is in this system. Um, I will tell you, people giving up power is, uh, it's very, it's very hard. Um, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not, it's impossible by any means. And you are not alone. There are tons and tons and tons of people like you that want to do this and would fight right next to you, right behind you, to, to make those changes. I don't want I guarantee to stop that. you other two. I hope you can fold your answers into any other questions. Thank you very much for your question. Anyone else? Did you have a question? Maybe you'd like to continue, Marilinda, on answering her question. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, I too want to congratulate you for actively uh, being involved, and, and I would echo um, what, and I'm sorry, I didn't read it, Aruna. <laughs> yes, no, that's okay. I wasn't sure if I was pronouncing that correctly. Um, said in that Changes can be made, you know, within the uh, sort of smaller scale of the process by state, you know, by caucus, by primary. A good example of this is actually how the legislative bodies work in the states in terms of when they meet, at what hours, et cetera. In New Hampshire, we are a part-time legislature and we're in for six months of the year. And a lot of your responsibilities and you know the time that you must necessarily, aside from your basic responsibilities, uh, you know, of voting on session days and whatnot, vary depending on what committee um, you want to be on. If you're on finance, I was on that for uh, two terms, so that was very busy. You know, it was almost like a big slumber party <laughs> during budget season. Um, but in Rhode Island, for example, they don't meet until I think 4 p.m., and that's because they want uh, people that you know, work a day job to also be able to participate. And, you know, it's true, it's hard to make the changes, but it is possible. There is that um, room. So I would encourage you to, uh, you know, find like-minded people and why not start it yourself? You know, In the last few it. minutes of this debate, I want to double check if there are any more questions. No? So I think we've all been very polite this morning. None of us have got down to the nitty gritty of this campaign. We've, we've danced around it, we've sort of alluded to it, but we're live streaming, but we're not on KGNU, so you can let yourself go a bit. We see this morning the Wisconsin results. You do not have to be political. I'm asking you to be human and look at what is going on and the time we have left up to 2016. What is the prescription for putting right or maintaining, if you think it's absolutely fine, the state of affairs with our political system going forward to November. Daniel. Well, I think one of the, the interesting things is, is going to be the Republican convention. I think after last night, the, 
uh, the odds of uh, Mr. Trump getting a majority of the delegates needed before the convention are, are much slimmer. Uh, and I think what you will see is a uh, contested convention, which we haven't had in 30 or 40 years. I wouldn't be at all surprised, and I, I should <clears throat> out myself here as kind of a mugwump Main Street Republican. I wouldn't at all be surprised that uh, the, 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 the convention and the delegates assembled there choosing someone other uh, than uh, Donald Trump uh, or Ted Cruz. Um, and insofar as it's really the job of a political party to win elections, and neither one of those candidates at this point seems very likely to win in a national election, I don't think that's a bad thing. So, so will Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan be flown in on a magnificent white I don't know, as, as, a, as a John Kasich supporter, I'd like to yeah. think that we have a candidate who's ready, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't, but, uh, but what, yeah. Daniel, if, yes. if he is flown in on the back of a white yes. steed in shining armor, yes. Uh, do you have a problem with this? Because it's no, not, not. It's not it, catered for in yes. the orthodoxy as we have come to know it. Is it? Yes, I think. Is the, it? Uh, I think in the orthodoxy, uh, the, as we have come to know it, which, 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 let me play that through. So the orthodoxy would be, well, whoever has won the most votes, that should be the nominee. Well, because that's democracy in most right. countries. Right, and so that would be Donald Trump, who's probably won, will, who won the most votes and the most delegates. He won't have a, a needed majority. And I would say, should a political party uh, be forced to nominate someone that really only a third of the part that party's supporters are behind? Uh, and who's not likely to win the national election, that doesn't sound like a recipe for a successful political party. So I would say I don't have a problem with it. I think it actually would be a good thing for the Republican Party to nominate someone who would stand the best chance of winning in the fall. I think that's really the job and, of the party. And before you go, I mean, you did out yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to ask you about Hillary and superdelegates. Many would equally say the superdelegate system uh, is stacked. I think you will see the Republican Party uh, emulate their democratic confreres in the next uh, reform cycle and, and have more superdelegate-like uh, 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 apparatus, uh, superdelegates in the next nominating campaign. That was something the Democrats uh, course corrected themselves, I think it was in the late 70s, where they had gone too far in the direct democracy range to the point where it wasn't, didn't seem to be practical, so they've kind of come back uh, to a um, uh, a model that blends the, 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 the direct democracy and the superdelegates, which are more elitist, and I think that probably puts them in a stronger position. I have to tell you all that the question, I'm a foreign correspondent, the question I'm most asked around the world is why is America not one man, one vote? I'm in Japan, people cannot understand superdelegates. They cannot understand what you're talking about, this blended system. But I'm going to get to Aruna now because I'm going to ask yeah. you the same thing. So I, I will tell you, um, this, this whole notion of of Paul Ryan coming in to be the Republican presidential nominee. Paul Ryan is a, is a lovely person. He was the chairman of my committee for a good 10 months before he became the accidental speaker. He's not somebody who wanted the job. Which he denied frequently, of and, course. But we've got, you know, the accidental speaker. Now, if we're talking about elevating this to the accidental president, it's not just somebody who, I mean, I think, Daniel, you mentioned, I'm not sure if the Republicans should nominate someone who only has 30% of the vote. This guy is zero. This guy didn't run, he didn't, he was never scrutinized, he never faced any of the debate challenges, any of those hard questions. And if the Republican Party is comfortable with that, that is, that is, that's a different level of elitism is it than superdelegates even would. Sorry, is it at some level desperate measures? Things have not gone quite as they were intended, perhaps, by the powers that be. So given that the complete game plan has had to change at last minute, maybe Paul Ryan is you know, the sine qua non of ha hanging on to power at all, in any form, in this quite, election cycle. Quite possibly. I do think that, that, that if you're talking about the 30% that have voted, I definitely don't think they will be satisfied with a sort of drop-in candidate at the last minute. Um, it, just by way of a side anecdote, you know, where I go to work, there's a lot of Capitol Police officers, and I was talking to some of them right before I came up here, and they're oftentimes offered, you know, you can do, get overtime, you can work overtime at the conventions. And nine, well, let's just go ahead and say nine out of nine of them kept saying, I'll go to Philadelphia, I'll take Philadelphia, definitely go to Philadelphia, happy to volunteer for Philadelphia. There is a lot of concern as to what's going to happen in Cleveland frankly. You Thank know, you, Runa. I have to cut tough. you off because we have three minutes left. Marilyn sure. de Garcia. 
I think I like the idea of having this intense scrutiny of a candidate, but honestly, I think when we talk about it, it's a little overrated, right? I mean, Paul Ryan, he may not be scrutinized, but Donald Trump's been scrutinized now, you know, for how many months? Has that Except mattered Except for his audits, all? his tax well, records. Well, has that, but then, okay, Just Hillary Clinton has been scrutinized. The Clinton Foundation, her uh, FBI scandal. And we await the Panama Papers revelations well, with great interest. But the point is, here are, right, here are our front runners. You know, on either side, the scrutinized one. And then Marco Rubio, who was for a time considered, you know, someone that was going to emerge, you know, from the fray. What was his biggest scandal? That he owned a boat? You know, I mean, is that what he was scrutinized about? His, how, how well, you know, he managed his, his debt coming from college and whatnot. So I think it's a little overblown. Um, but I think as a country, we're a little bit used to this sort of contradiction between who we vote for and who we get, you know, the contradiction between, for example, the popular vote and the electoral college, we're used to that by now. This issue with super delegates and delegates, um, you know, with the Bernie and Hillary situation, we've gone through that. So now when it comes to the machinations of a convention, I think obviously it will be uh, quite a raucous uh, situation and you know, maybe something we haven't seen for a long time, but I think we'll all get over it and, <laughs> and understand we'll that to. this is the way it works. I don't know. In the um, last yeah, minute, I'm going to do something that you're going to hate, but I'm going to love because I'm asking you what will happen in November. You have a one sentence response, Marilinda, That's your easy. forecast for November. It's easy. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Your wish for November. Um, I, I wish to have a president that I can look at in an aspirational way, um, someone that continues on the tradition of what I think our founding fathers, uh, you know, I'm always humbled when I read. Thank you, more than one sentence. Hear. Sorry, no. sorry, Aruna, <laughs> well, what would yeah. you wish, what do you predict will happen and what will wish? Facile comments, welcomed. I want to narrow this down at this juncture. What, what do I think will happen? Um, yeah. I think there is gonna be a lot of emotion, a lot of passion, I think some hurt feelings going into November, leaving that there. What do I wish? I wish that we can, we as a country can elect a president that gives us the government we want. Daniel, you get the last want. minute. Okay. Uh, what I wish is that we would have a president, John Kasich, uh, in a Republican-controlled Congress. Uh, what I think will happen was that we will have uh, President Hillary Clinton uh, and the, I think the Senate is a toss-up and the House will remain Republican. And there's so much yet left yet to discuss and yeah. time has run out. It's always a way, don't you know? So this has been the Conference on World Affairs at CU Boulder broadcast previously uh, till 9.30 by KGNU Denver Boulder. We have had our guests today, Marilinda Garcia, Aruna Kalyanam, and Daniel Steed. I've been your moderator for this panel, Claudia Craig, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much.